you all for joining us. So this April meeting was not planned on our schedule for 2021. So um, we had a couple important topics and changes that were time sensitive. So we wanted to go ahead and add a meeting. So thank you all. It was kind of last minute to add it. So I'm glad many of you were able to join. Um, before we get started with the program, <laughs> I'm going to use this forum because I was going to send something out on the listserv, but um, we are starting to plan for our Ankara Regional Meeting 2021, which is going to be in October. And so if you're interested in volunteering, please email me. I'll put my email in the chat. And um, also thinking, so I'm going to be the chair, the co-chair of the regional meeting in 2022 in Tucson. It will be in person. And um, so if you want to reach out to me, if you'd be interested um, in volunteering for that, we're going to need a lot more volunteers for the in-person meeting. So again, I'll put my email in the chat and just let me know. So. Um, to get started, uh, Richard and Lori are here to talk about the new routing process for DUAs, BAAs, et cetera. <laughs> so go ahead anytime you're ready. Absolutely. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll just first uh, be happy to introduce myself. My name is Richard Okoto. Uh, I am the uh, privacy analyst working in the uh, Office of Regulatory Compliance uh, with, of course, uh, my colleague here, uh, Lori Hopper. And actually, in this specific role, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been working for about seven, eight months now. So it's a relatively new position, but it's definitely a lot to learn and an exciting uh, opportunity to grow and to learn more about uh, people, healthcare, healthcare policy, and uh, and absolutely, yeah, this is that's a great opportunity for me. You're still on mute, Lori. Thank you. I thought I was off. I am Lori Hopper. I am the Director of Institutional Compliance and Privacy Officer here at the university. I've been here for a little over five years, so I've seen um, a lot of things happen around here, but I have to tell you that this is one of the most exciting things we're going to tell you about that we've come up with in our department in terms of creating efficiency and cost savings and such. So I hope that we can just let you know um, how much we appreciate you guys um, wanting and being willing to kind of listen to our little spiel about it and help us out by keeping other folks moving them in the right direction as well. So Richard, do you want to take it away? Uh, absolutely. So I will share my screen. All right, and right here you'll be, see, this is our uh, HIPAA uh, homepage. Uh, and if you want, you could uh, if you can you can go on Google. You can type in uh, HIPAA Home Research Administration, and then it will take take you straight to our homepage. And then this is actually uh, and there's actually a few a few spots that you can uh, go to locate to route any requests for any uh, B, BAAs, uh, DUAs, or MTAs. So one of the first uh, locations on our website to send a request will be right here, this uh, data sharing request portal. And then it will take you to a red cap uh, form or a survey where you'll fill in uh, like a Comber pro 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 protocol number, name, all the necessary elements, uh, email address, department, uh, the PI name, email address, phone number, uh, project title, description of the data, uh, the necessary or the needed uh, PHI uh, data elements that are at play here. And then, of course, the reason for the data use and additional uh, information here. And then right here, you can upload uh, the BAA, DUA, or the necessary or the appropriate uh, agreement template. And then myself, or actually particularly Christine, will be the one uh, to, to review uh, the document. And actually, uh, myself, Lori, and Christine, and another individual are also receive that um, Request, request once you press uh, submit. So they will all be able to uh, get notified that someone has sent a request. And actually on our HIPAA webpage, there's actually multiple ways to access that uh, survey right here. Uh, yeah, the first one is right here, data sharing request portal. Another one is right here in gold, visit the portal. 
and then it'll take you right to our, our REDCap survey. And then another uh, avenue is right here, data sharing request form. And then you can access it in any of those three ways. And of course, uh, myself and Lori uh, are definitely updating the website uh, on a regular basis. So from time to time, this, uh, this specific icon may be placed in a different location. So for the most part, if it's not there, or for any reason it may not be there, it should be uh, here and at a consistent uh, basis. So absolutely. And is there anything else I'm missing, Lori? Or uh, missed out? No, on? I think that that's a great overview. I just want to kind of emphasize a couple of things that you mentioned. Um, the first one is actually right there on the page that you're showing, and you kind of referenced the three buttons down here with additional resources, BAAs, DUAs, and MTAs. So Richard, if you'll click over to the portal, I want to I want to um, point something out about MTAs that you guys probably already caught. And Pamela, I haven't read your note yet. I'll read it in just a quick second. So you see stop and stop. There are a couple stop signs here. And what these are meant to be are wayfinding and to help get you in the right place when you've landed here and here is not the right place, okay? So this was the best way that we could figure out to do it for now. If you guys have ideas about how we could sedate that better and reroute you in a better manner, please let us know. We wanna improve this. It's, the tool is for you. Um, it does help us on the back end, but the whole goal is to help you guys out. But MTAs under the second stop, CDAs, confidentiality certificates, non-monetary research collaboration, or MTAs go through the, pro the CREO process. So just like you've always been doing them, MTAs are one, but we've got the link here in case you land here to reroute you, redirect you to that. So hopefully if um, the goal is just to get one funnel and, and help get people to the right place in, in as few steps as possible with as least amount of emails and questions going back and forth as possible. Um, to Jessica's quick question on non-employee agreements, yes, non-employee agreements like the ones we get from Denver Health, is that correct? I don't work on these, but Christine has worked on these historically, right? Excellent. Yes, that's what I thought. Yes, these continue to go through this process. So we would call them, you know, we see, I think Natalie termed it, BAAs, DUAs, and all the other stuff. And that's part of the other stuff. Absolutely. And if you land here by accident and you fill this out, you know, no harm, no foul. We're just going to help you get to where you need to be. Um, what else was I thinking about? Oh, you have probably figured out that what you see here is a lot of the same information that you've historically been putting on what we would call that data summary page. Um, you're not going to use that data summary page anymore. We don't want you duplicating energy. We want you doing it one time. We don't want to duplicate and go in and type in what you're putting on a piece of paper on the back end. This lets it feed right into our back end tools, our reporting, our documentation, and even our DocuSign we're building into this to make life easier for signatory authority. So the goal is to speed up the process, make it more efficient, tighter, friendlier, all of the above. And we want you to be a part of this because we want it to be our tool. We will administer it, but if you have ideas or things that are not working, please, please, please provide us the feedback. We won't know unless you tell us. Um, some of this stuff has to stay here. It's there for regulatory reasons, but otherwise, you know, we've got flexibility. So let's build it, um, build it so that it works for us. Couple of questions I'm seeing in the chat over here. Great new tool. Thank you. Might go into this later, but talk about the differences and overlap with the existing CREO portal. Touched on that, but just to be really clear, the goal is that there is no overlap. The goal is that the stop signs that we have and the folks that might receive things through this would know if you accidentally landed here and you need to be with CREO and we would move it over. So that not move it, we can't move it, but we wanna stop you before you fill out this form and get you to the right place. Likewise, we've done some front end, a lot of front end communication, actually, including through OGC in your newsletter, I think in Amy's newsletter, she mentioned, um, no joke, April 1st, April Fool's Day, this is coming out. And um, we kind of thought we were cute there, maybe not so funny, but at least cute. Um, and so, uh, the, again, the goal is that there not be any overlap. And thanks for giving us the opportunity to point that out. If you see that there is, let us know so that we can get rid of it. That's the goal. If it doesn't, if it's not working, then it's no good. We want it, we want it to be good. Um, Pamela, guidance document linked through the CREO portal. Could it be updated and cross-posted? 
Okay, yes. Um, and I didn't know that it hadn't been. Um, we may have not communicated that clearly to the folks at CREO, but I think that's kind of the playbook that they have. We were um, hoping to kind of get that cross communication kind of like what we've put here. So I'll take a note there, or maybe Richard, you could make a note and we'll um, circle back with them. Again, Pamela, thank you so much. Sophie, so, where do we submit equipment loans that industry is loaning for research purposes? That's number one. That question is for someone else. That's not in my lane of expertise. And if equipment loan has a data sharing component to it, aha, do we submit it through this data sharing request portal? That's a what I would call a complex question because it's going to involve meshing two different types of agreements probably together. That is one where I... I would say for now, until we can figure out how to get that embedded into this existing or our process that we're rolling out now, it might be best to continue to work with your person in your normal contact in OGC for contracting, as well as Christine for the data. Um, or if I'm saying that wrong, I would just say existing process until we figure out a new process. Sophie, can you give me a thumbs up or a nod if that will work in some way? Excellent. Thank you. Help us remember that if, if it turns out we need to get that adjusted here, that's a couple of clicks in red cap, not a big deal, we can do it. Go away, email notification. Okay, ah, the email, thank you, Richard. Reg.compliance, reg the same email address that we've always used. Nothing has changed. If you have questions as you're filling out the form, you can save it and return to it later. Exactly. Um, so I wanna point that out. Richard, back to you, what am I missing? Uh, no, actually, I was just about to uh, to add that. So if, if for any reason uh, you, there's certain elements of data that uh, of the form that you are have not been able to uh, to have access to, you can of course save it, uh, return later. Of course, I included uh, the regulatory compliance email. If you have any feedback or any concerns, any questions uh, related to the red cap or any information that you're inputting, just so that so that you have the best updated information, and we we do too. So. Of course, we're happy to help. And of course, Christine will always still be uh, playing a, a very key uh, major role in terms of uh, reviewing a lot of these agreements. So it's it's a pretty con a consistent um, and a, a relatively new process, but we hope that uh, in the future, this will be uh, very more comfortable for people, so. Absolutely, and I forgot to mention, you know, Christine would have been here, but I believe she had a, a, a commitment that she wasn't able to arrange around. So um, otherwise she would have been the mouthpiece of this. We're just yeah. standing in for her. And we really appreciate what you guys in the RAIN group do all the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, and yes, Christine, is she agreed to come back at a later RAIN meeting to talk about general information around BAAs, DUAs, and et cetera, of when to use them and why. Um, but a question about this. So I often don't have all the information to fill into this form. Is there a way to download the questions on it so I can, you know, e have a email to the program folks to say this is the information I need? I know it's duplicate, but I mean, I love this new system and I think this is gonna be so much faster and so much more organized, but there is that component of, I'm guessing, I didn't see, can you save it for later? Or is there a way to just standardize questions so that I could request Natalie, the program? Would it help if we created like a PDF of this document and had it available for download next to where you are, maybe at the top of the portal or something. I think what you're saying is I'd like to have the questions in advance so that I could gather the information and have it all in front of me whenever I input it. That's exactly what I'm saying and that would be helpful. And you know, we may be able to do a couple of things. I think the PDF would be good. I think what would be great would be if we could put it in a Word document so that you could fill it in and other people could share it on Teams and fill in and it would make you even more efficient if that's valuable. So. Um, we could, of course, we still, we really want to get to using the input, the intake through this. And I don't think you're asking to go a different route. It's just a way of gathering efficiently on the front end. Right. Because oftentimes we know this agreement is coming, 
And so it's nice to work with the project team in advance to get, you know, before when it was the Word document and we were submitting it via email, I've been trying to get folks to help me fill it out ahead of time so that when we do get the document, I could just submit. So that would yeah. be kind of a, a nice feature for this. That's a great operational observation, right? We don't do that part. And I appreciate that feedback. That is absolutely something we can get ready for you guys. When we have it, we will upload it here. And maybe I'm just trying to think about how to efficiently communicate. Um, as soon as we have it available and make sure we've got it tidy as well. Um, and of course, continuous feedback is per perfect. But uh, we'll upload it here. If we can get it in a Word document, would you still want it in a PDF as well, just for options, or would you just would Word be the preferred? Tool? As long as it's Word. editable, I mean, most everybody has a PDF version that can edit, but Word yeah. is probably okay. Just simple. So if we can't get, because what I'm worried about with Word is all behind the scenes stuff, and I'm not going to waste your time on that. But we'll find you a way to gather information so you can have it in front of you in advance. We'll upload it, a link in one way or another. We'll let you know that we've done that. And then maybe you can communicate it out to the folks on this on this meeting group. Definitely. Cool. Are, do you. we have time for other, are there other comments right off the bat? Seems that I asked You know, Sarah, I love your thoughts. So what you're telling me is you have an example that Creo did that we could use to inform what we're doing on this side. Is that fair? Um, it's actually a form that I created in, in Microsoft Teams uh, in forms. Uh -huh. And so I just basically took whatever the intake form used to be um, and used that to create my own form. And so when the PIs or whoever's doing it, um, they submit that. Um, with all the information to me, and then I can manage and, uh, you know, put in the attachments and all of that and submit it um, once I get everything from whoever we're, we're collaborating with. That sounds amazing. And I have to tell you, Teams Forms is something that I haven't personally explored, but if you are willing to collaborate and help us learn as well as do something that would be useful to you guys, um, you know, I'm not opposed to having different options available to you if it makes sense. It's template. We do it once, we provide it to you, and it's useful for ongoing. Would you be willing if we reached out? Yeah, no, I would be happy to share it. And then um, I, as far as I know, we can share it with anybody in the university. So then if, you know, Natalie wanted it, she could take it and just basically change the settings so that when somebody hits submit, it goes to Natalie. Or, you know, basically any other unit could set it so that it's their own form and then when it submits, it submits to whatever that person's email address is <clears throat> that they want to manage these. Richard, sounds like a project, huh? So, awesome. Um, I and I don't know if you're, great. you said you're not very familiar with um, Teams forms, but uh, it's super intuitive. Okay. Um, I literally had no training. I opened it, created, I've done, I've created probably 10 different forms that we use now. It's, it's very intuitive. That is awesome. I feel like if I've overcome red cap in some ways, I'm a little empowered on some of these things that are more intuitive. So thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. And That's keep great. thinking about this as you use it the first time you're going to have some probably hopefully more feedback. Don't just sit there and be frustrated. Just <laughs> shoot us off an email. Um, we're pretty thick skinned and we just wanna have a good product for you. That's gonna be what success looks like for, for us. So um, I don't wanna take up any more time. Um, we definitely have more time. If there's more questions, please ask them while you have Richard and Lori here. There are some branching logic questions built in, so we'll have to we'll figure out a way to get those into what we provide for you for your information collection. Um, but do know that you know certain things open up and or close depending on how you respond on a variety of things throughout the form. I'll also just mention that's an option in the forms team right. as well, or in the team's form as well, is you can do branching. So um, that's probably one of the biggest things that will need to be changed from the version that I made is just how the branching works compared to your new red cap form. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, I've tried to make the branching work so that depending on, you know, what kind of 
um, form it is or who, which direction the data is being shared or you know that kind of thing that it opens up what's needed. So Sarah, while you're, you seem to have all of this knowledge and I really appreciate it. My question for you is, do you know if Teams Forms integrates with REDCap or could be configured to integrate? Our goal is to have our data live in REDCap because of the security functionality. That's why we're, we're here instead of somewhere else as the final landing spot. Um, I don't actually know because I've never actually used REDCap. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, maybe that's just a Google question <laughs> that we could yeah. see, you know, if that's oh, a gosh, possibility. Yeah. I mean, yeah, simple as that. I mean, yeah. And Amanda might know who works with REDCap. So we've got resources. Okay. It's such an awesome dialogue. Other, other questions, Natalie? We've got one more in the chat um, about the approval process changing as well, or is it changing as well? So yes and no. The part that's not changing is the signatory authority. So Allison will still remain the signatory authority for agreements that go through regulatory compliance and signatory authority will remain where it is if you're embedding let's say BAA language into a contract or something like that that's being managed from another group. So that doesn't change. What does change? And I say yes, because it's the process. The goal is that Allison is not bombarded with DocuSigns and or other types of agreements to sign as soon as the other party knows that they're sending us their form. That's not efficient for any of us and it's confusing. And so the goal is that everyone, that the funnel remains the key place and then when when Christine reviews behind the scenes, she places any comments and then her approval. And Allison isn't even notified that the document is ready to go until Christine approves within the red cap form. That shoots Allison a notification. And hopefully, this is where we're still working. We're working on the process as we go. Hopefully she'll receive the document itself to either DocuSign or to sign through Adobe PDF or something of that nature. Does that make sense? Awesome. We are really hoping that this speeds up the process, reduces the amount of scanning and hard wet, you know, wet signatures. Um, you guys probably know, but we're probably the last department on the campus to move to full electronic signatures. And I will just probably open a bottle of champagne today. That that <laughs> <laughs> we're working on it, you guys. We're trying to speed up the process, like we said. Honestly, I think the process goes so quickly. Oh, good, good. As it is. So this this will only make it easier, I'm sure, on your side for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm sure uh, I think Lori mentioned that this specific project has been going on for about a, a year or two years now, Lori. Yeah, you know, guys, staffing and working on projects like this versus doing your day-to-day -day work is more challenging as far as time than just about anything. So that's why we feel so proud to actually be live and ready to receive your feedback. And, and you know, I don't know, you guys know the feeling when you finally cross the finish line after a marathon. So let's yep. let the conversation go on after after we're done here. Um, you know, Christine's email and regulatory reg reg .compliance, as Richard said, you can reach us through our direct emails, lori.hopper at CU Anschutz, and we have um, and richard.akoto at CU Anschutz as well. Um, and we have Richard, what do we have a HIPAA as well as a privacy mailbox now? Absolutely. HIPAA uh, mailbox uh, where any of the your requests are routed to us, we'll be able to address them uh as they come in so yeah yeah and we created privacy because we're learning that the world globally has a lot more privacy than just hipaa including gdpr and things like that so we'll see you on the flip side in the privacy email box <laughs> thank you so much again yes thank you great thank you richard and Lori, for being here and um we can always send more questions direct to them you have their emails now and feedback it sounds like absolutely all right see you later thank you absolutely thank you for being here take care all right um next up we have uh some folks from the office of grants and contracts sounds like shane is going to be 
leading our present their presentation and help from Garrett and Alex. So cool. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I'm not going to share my screen or my my picture because I gave myself a very unfortunate COVID haircut recently, so no one needs to see this. So this is going to be a blank screen for everyone. So um, what we're here today. Oh, did I, yeah, I shared this. Do I share? Yes, okay. we're sharing. I, I can't. I, the little thing didn't pop up on my other screen. So uh, Alex and uh, Garrett and I are here to talk about the BioSketch and other updates for NIH that just are going to affect in a couple of weeks. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat box and then Alex and Garrett will address them after I'm done presenting. Uh, just a note before we get started, um, we did not make these requirements, so please be kind to us. We are just the messengers. So if you do have complaints, you know, send them to NIH or whatnot. Uh, we did not make these requirements. So uh, some background information about these changes. Uh, this was announced last month uh, in this notice uh, from NIH. So if you haven't seen this or you haven't shared this with your PI yet, uh, please do so as soon as possible. Uh, the changes are impacting the BioSketch, which they have reformatted. And then and also there are additional requirements for the other support page. Uh, these do go into effect on May 25th of this year. So any new applications or any RPPRs uh, for the June or July cycle, you just need to know that you do need to follow these new requirements as of that date. Uh, kind of the background for these changes, uh, there have been a lot of concerns uh, in a number of years about foreign support and foreign influence on researchers. Uh, if you've been following the news, there have been a number of researchers across the nation who have been arrested or jailed uh, for failing to disclose foreign influence. So what NIH is trying to do here is just basically align their documents and their requirements with other government, -wide gu um, government guidance and then also to ensure that we do have transparency for foreign support and foreign influence on our researchers. So for the BioSketch, and they just kind of reorganized a couple of these places. Uh, for Section A, the personal statement, um, they added the research support, which was previously in Section D. So they just moved that to Section A. So hopefully that's not a big deal. Uh, Section B could be potentially burdensome. Uh, basically, your PI has to identify in reverse chronological order all positions they've ever held, uh, regardless of payment, uh, if it was foreign or domestic. Uh, you know, anything that they've ever, any academic or scientific position they've held, they do need to list on Section B now. And then Section D, which was the research support for our non-fellowship awards, they've removed this, so it no longer exists. If you do have a fellowship award, uh, they just renamed this uh, scholastic performance. For the other support page, uh, for the page itself, uh, they just added two things. They reorganized it, so you do need to separate your PI's funding projects from also any in-kind contributions. So just a slight change there. And they did add a certification now for any senior or key personnel or PI. Uh, they just do, do uh, need to attest that everything that they've submitted or everything that they have included is true and accurate. Uh, the reason why they do this is this is how they prosecute us basically uh, for any false claims or false statements. So uh, this is just uh, the government's way to ensure that our PIs are providing true and accurate information for us. So now we also have um, what they're telling us. <laughs> so for any support for this other support page, uh, they are telling us in all capital boldface underlying letters that we do have to include all resources that have been made available to your PI. So basically everything that they've ever had. Uh, this is includes, but is not limited, limited to, this is just from straight from NIH, uh, any resources or financial support from any foreign or domestic institution. Uh, any consulting agreement that they've had, and then any in-kind contributions. Uh, so for the definition for all, it does not include, however, training awards, prizes, or gifts. So basically how we're interpreting this, just how NIH has told us, if it's not a training award, if it's not a prize, if it's not a gift, we have to report everything that they've had. Uh, and this does impact any C senior or key personnel. This is not for other significant contributors on that award. And now for the real fun part. Uh, Shane, can yeah. I ask a quick question on that slide? Sure. Does that mean anything that's routed through CU Medicine related to, you're saying any consulting agreements through CU Medicine would have to be included Identified. even if they don't have dedicated FTE to it? Um, I'm going to defer to Garrett or Alex. Do one of you guys want to address that? Are they getting support on it? They aren't getting any FTE support for their 1.0, no. So if they're not getting any support, then it wouldn't meet the definition in that situation. But I mean, if they're getting any support at all, it would need to show up here. 
Can, can I follow up real quick on that? Um, so I'm always confused with uh, people who are working on sponsored research. So, you know, a clinical trial where, um, you know, an industry sponsored clinical trial where they do not get direct, again, FTE support, but they may get some fee and the fee then gets used somehow in the future, maybe to, you know, might supplement their salary or it might be used to buy a computer or something like that. So what's your comment on that? Generally speaking, my comment on that is going to always be error on the side of providing the information and let NIH decide what they want to do with that information. Because like you said, it may end up, it may end up providing them support down the road. Um, and so it's better just to have it in there and to we, cause I'm sure that we're going to get further guidance and clarification on this. Uh, once everybody starts throwing more thoughts on it and there, and Shane, I'm sure is going to get to it here in a minute. There is a pretty good FAQ webpage on this kind of addressing some of these specific issues, but again, they're on the side of including rather than not including. I had a question really quick on the slide back. I, it stated, I think it was number four. You said something about a signature block? Oh no, number four, it was number five. Yep, that's on there. And we're gonna be looking for that. Um, and this, and I'm sorry, but hold on. This is on the other support page? The other yeah. support document. Yeah. So, I mean, so we were just actually in the previous conversation, we we're having discussions about digital signatures. <laughs> Um, so, you know, throw a digital signature on there, your PI is just going to have to do it. However, obviously we're not looking for wet ink signatures, that kind of thing, but the signature block is required because you're essentially attesting to the information that's on there. Um, because what it's really doing is, as Shane pointed out, is it's putting the onerous back on the PI to say this information is correct. Okay. So it's just the PI that has to sign it, not in the institution as well. That's correct. It's the PI signing off on the content of that. Document. Okay, I, I see it now. Sorry, I missed that earlier. Thank no, that's a great point. That's a great point because it is, yeah, it is the PI at the PI attesting to what there's what's on that uh, other support page. Great. Thank you. We have another question in the chat on the same topic about how far back in time do PIs have to list their positions in Part B? So uh, this is going to go for. Um, anything that you're currently receiving funding for, I believe, um, you know, so if you were in, um, if it's if it's currently being given to you or if it's an active award, so if it's like the current four year uh, competitive, uh, I don't know, uh, funds for an NIH award, that's what they wanted listed. They don't want going all the way back in time um, for some of these larger U grants and things like that. That could be huge, right? So they just want the current competitive segment, total cost, uh, and just list it that way. So if it's a, if basically what it comes down to is if you really think about this, what they really are asking for is a snapshot in time right now, what your current support is. That's straightforward. Um, they don't want you to go back you know, thousands of years, that kind of thing. So it's, it's because they're going to be, and that's also why the signature is kind of important because you're attesting to it at the time that you're submitting it. So this is current right now, if that makes sense. Garrett, I think, and two, the, the question was around the positions for Part B. So that new section or how they're rewording that Part B on the bio sketch around their positions. What's the question? Is that uh, how far back in time do people have to list their positions in Part B? And I believe that's from once they get out of school, it's all the way forward. Yeah. All positions. I hate to say it, but all yeah. in this particular NOT really means all. <laughs> um, the only the only caveat there again is going to be you know the um, the the current uh, competitive segments. So. I mean, it's kind of a pain, but um, you know, if it's if it's not so, look at it this way: if all from a scientific perspective, current from a budgeting perspective, and if you think that it might should be listed in there, better off to add it than not add it. Okay, thanks. And then um, another question is: what defines in kind? That definition hadn't changed. 
Right, just an example for one of my PIs is he was written in as in kind as the PI for 5% for a, um, a, um, a grant related to a conference grant. And so we put, I always put that 5% on there as in kind, if that helps, David. And then Annabelle asked if it's still a max of five pages for the bio sketch, which I believe it is. Right, Garrett and Shane. Shane, you want to take that one? Um, I believe so. They haven't said anything that they've changed that. Yeah, I think I saw that in an FAQ that it's still five pages. So now we have some other fun stuff to share. Um, Shane, Shane, I think yeah, that, I'm sorry, here. you know, I think you guys are kind of hitting on exactly why we're having this meeting because there are because it's because it is like okay, this is kind of a sea change. Um, my guess is some of the stuff might get a little squishy uh, after May 25th. Uh, when I would think Shane, based on your reviewing of some of this stuff, like things might change, like the five page limit and that kind of stuff. It might might end up being like that they that they push it out a little bit. We'll see. Who knows. Sorry, go ahead, Jane. Oh, sure. Um, so for the other fun stuff that we have, we do have a, additional requirements for the other support page, uh, which also goes into effect on uh, May 25th. So if you have a PI that has foreign support, uh, including any contracts, grants, other research agreements, uh, anything with a foreign support component or any from foreign government or foreign institution, uh, they do need to provide, or your PI does, does need to provide those documents in English language to NIH. Uh, so if they are written in a foreign language, you will need to have them translated before we submit them to NIH. And the other new requirements about our, uh, mandatory disclosures. So in between the JITs and RPPRs, if any new information comes to light or any new agreements come, uh, we do need to immediately notify the grants management officer for that award uh, and provide them this documentation for that foreign support. Uh, for science uh, CV, uh, for the biosketch, uh, it was supposed to be updated at the end of March. Uh, so you can easily, hopefully, easily transfer the current biosketch information to the new format. Uh, for the other support page, unfortunately, uh, the government has said that this will not be available until at least this fall. So uh, fiscal year 2022, which starts on October 1st for the federal government. Um, that's their hope. Um, probably not going to make that uh, for uh, October 1st. Um, until that template is available in Science CV, you do need to use the Word format page, uh, convert it to a PDF, and then just e-sign it. Uh, for that other support page. So for the impacts, uh, what we can anticipate already uh, is because this is uh, effective on May 25th, so any RPPRs uh, do need to conform to the new biosketch requirements. So if you do have an RPPR due in June or July, you do need to use the new uh, biosketch format. Um, NIH is giving us a little bit of a grace period for new applications, uh, only for applications. Uh, so we can continue to use the old version of the biosketch until January 25th of next year. Uh, they won't automatically disqualify or withdraw our application uh, if we use the uh, old version, uh, but it's just the best practice to start using the new version as soon as possible. Uh, we did also provide, or Natalie's going to send out this PowerPoint after we're done. Uh, so a couple of resources that you might need. Uh, we just provided you the notice, uh, again, from NIH. Share that with your PIs as soon as possible. Uh, both the pages from NIH for the biosketch and then also the other support page have been updated. Uh, there's two separate tabs now, so anything due before May 25th and anything due on or after May 25th. And as Garrett mentioned too, uh, they also have updated their FAQ, so I pulled this up for you. Um, as you can see, they added a whole lot of new questions about all these new requirements on the FAQ page for other support. It's all searchable, as so you can type in whatever you're looking for, uh, and they're continuing to update this page frequently. So just as questions come up or, you know, ramifications that NIH hasn't thought of yet, um, as they come up, they're just adding to this page. So very helpful page if you have any specific questions. Hopefully that addresses what you're looking for. Uh, so are there any other questions for Garrett or Alex or anything else we can address that we might know of off the top of our head? I have a quick question to see. I was doing a little looking at the templates and with the biosketch component and in uh, section A with the projects, it sounds like you can only choose three or up to four projects to highlight and up to four um, citations. Was that your impression as well? So that it's, you're limited, you can't select all the 
projects in the last three years like you could before and completed. It's just limited to three or four. Um, I'll, I'll defer to Garrett on that question. Yeah, I believe that's that was, um, I think that's a pretty old requirement if I remember correctly. Um, and I, the idea there was that um, they were supposed to be giving, the PIs were supposed to be giving their most relevant um, references. Right, but now for the new the new format, it's it's got a limit to only three or four is what I thought I read in the FAQs. Because it's not just automatically moving the whole section D to A was my impression. So I don't remember seeing that. If you, get, if you can pull it up and cool. Yeah, let me. Let me yeah. see if I can so, find it. There's a couple questions in chat if you want to look at that and I'll, yeah. I'll try to find where I saw that. Um, so as uh, Melissa, to your points, uh, to your question there. So uh, gifts are not, um, if, if Shane mentioned at the very top, um, if you wanted to go back to that slide real quick. Oh yeah, Shane, I can share my screen again. Yeah. Uh, where was the Your list for other support? Yeah, there it is. Oops, right here. Yeah. So training, training awards, prizes, and money. Um, so gifts are obviously not going to account for that in that Melissa, but division and department support should be listed. is in support of the research, it needs to be disclosed. Yep, that's what Alex was saying, yeah. Um, okay, for an RPPR due after May, do we need to include other support for key personnel in the new format, even if the other support hasn't changed from last year? So, okay, so, so here's the situation. So this goes into effect on June 25th, uh, which will skip all of the May RPPRs. Uh, it will hit the June 1st RPPRs, but I believe if I remember correctly, there are only about six. When you guys are really going to see this, I've already looked ahead, um, to is June 15th RPPR deadline. I think there's 40 or 50 RPPRs that we're going to have to process around that time. So that's the biggest moment you guys are going to start seeing this and the PIs are going to have to start um, signing off and attesting to all these things. Besides, obviously, any JIT documents that are um, being submitted after uh, May 25th. And so I don't think Eric's on the call, but um, uh, he's obviously very much aware of these changes too. Um, so Eric's handling the RPPR side of uh, this communication or aware of all this communication. So he's on, he's on top of that. And then we're gonna be very much on top of uh, the June 1st and June 15th changes for this. So we have a little bit of time, uh, but you know, as uh, now that we were saying from the very beginning, that's part of the reason why we wanted to get out ahead of this um, so that everybody can kind of get their changes queued up um, in May uh, uh, for the June deadlines that we're gonna be seeing, so. Yeah. Uh, can I make a comment here? Yeah, sure. Of course uh, sure. Hey, for the other support, the instructions still have not changed as far as you only need to provide other support for senior key personnel if the active support has changed. So if you do have to, if the active support has changed, then you do need to provide the other support in the new format. Thanks, David. Does that yeah. answer your question, Don? It looks like it got every part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I did find that um, it's in the bio sketch instructions. Shane, if I, I can share my screen of what I had sure. noted. There you go. Thank you. Let's see if I picked the right. Yeah. 
so this was the application guide and I highlighted it that you may cite up to four publications and it says or research project products, but, and maybe that's research products versus research projects. But in the example, it only listed three in the sample biosketch that they had on the website, they had three projects and four citations. So I wonder if the products thing is where I'm misinterpreting that for products versus projects. But was your interpretation that it could be all projects in section A? I'm not following your question. Though. The way I read this section yeah. was that it was research projects because in their sample that they they had, they just listed three. Um, but I'm wondering if I misread it that it's, I thought this word meant research projects. So they were, you were limited to projects to four. Project. But maybe that isn't for publications or research products. Or research products. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm reading this with a different light that. Sure. No, that's great. Well, because when I did, because I wasn't sure what they meant by research project product, I did go to the FAQ on that and the product. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll email NIH or something just to confirm. But your interpretation is we could list as many research projects as we wanted to. For the personal statement? Yeah. It's for publications or research project products. Yeah, because um, let me just, I'll show you this. Because this was the David, sample that they had, which Shane, had, I believe you have a link to in your presentation. David, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah. So it's kind of like a highlight for projects. Yeah, and I think that came about, I think it was like six or seven years ago. No, it's went longer back than that, but it was basically like, like Jessica's saying is it, it's just, just you're supposed to um, be highlighting what you, you know, what's important going on. So. Okay. Yeah, highlights. Like, so the theory there would be that you would write one of these for every single, you know, every single application, but we know that's not always the practice. So, but anyway, all right. So, you know, um, Okay, I've got a quick question. Um, if we still have time, this is Alex. Um, so I think one thing that seems like it's just a problem that we're going to see a lot of is the other support template requires you to report person months, but there's all these cases like Natalie mentioned where if it's through CU Medicine, yes, they're getting support, we should report that, but it's not going towards their FTE. Or even NIH defines these cases where it's supporting laboratory personnel or providing some kind of resource, but there's no FTE applied to that. In the past, putting zero calendar months has never been an option for effort, but it seems like that should be an option moving forward. Is that your understanding? I believe I saw it mentioned um, either in the FAQ or elsewhere that um, you can still put zero FTE, but you still have to estimate a value to that. Okay, that works for me. Thanks. Uh, 
Uh, I just want to go out and uh, thank Alex uh, and Shane for the work that they did putting this stuff together. And, um, you know, uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out or any more questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Great. Any more questions? We've got seven more minutes. <laughs> Can I ask a follow up to what um, Alex was just asking about the zero calendar month situation? If you estimate calendar months for, say, in a consulting agreement, I think it's going to pose an issue because, especially when you do a just in time, we've gotten kickback when someone is close to 12 calendar months or over. And so you could push someone over the 12 calendar months if you apply a, a percent, a calendar month to a consulting or something that is not that we don't normally count as effort. So Benita, your question there is how to deal with- um, Yeah, how to address to it. For example, if they have count, if, they, if it's a consulting agreement, for example, they are getting money. Like we have faculty that have these consulting agreements in different institutions. We don't really see that because it goes through CU Medicine and it goes directly to them. But if we now incorporate that into their other support, and even if you put minimal effort, if you, even if you assign a minimal calendar months to it, for a lot of faculty, it'll, it might push them close to 12 calendar months or over. And at least in the case of adjusting time, we get pushed back often if people are approaching 12 or over 12, because NIH wants to make sure they can support the, the, the pending project. So we want to be full disclosure, like we said, like you were saying, we want to document everything, but don't want to put us in a situation where we're constantly getting kicked back, especially for just in time where we're wanting to get the award through. We don't want to go through a lot of back and forth with someone's effort, especially if this is effort that we're not documenting, like through payroll or as a part of the effort that we're certifying for them. So I mean, you could, well, because hmm. even though it sounds like the instructions are saying assign an estimate of calendar months to it, NIH is <laughs> they're telling us one thing, but they're absolutely going to push back when we're in that situation. They they sure are right. I mean, and that's mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the thing. It's like they're yeah, they and and it's the chicken and egg conversation about effort always. Oh yes, they have effort, and in theory, yes, they are working on it in some way. But everybody knows if we get close to 12 or over 12, we're going to get kicked back as, um, you know, as them not having, looking like they can't really support the project. Yeah, I mean, this is, like I said, this is going to be, this is going to be interesting to see mm -hmm. um, how this, um, how this all trickles out uh, coming through. Um, especially like you're saying, especially with just in time documentation, where it's like, this is, you know, the expectation is you turning this around pretty quickly right. and they're going to look at it and just do some quick math on it. You know, um, I mean, I could, I, I can be pat about it and say, do your best. <laughs> um, but I, I do, I do, I do feel your pain there a little bit. Um, because just as we're in, just as we're reading these, uh, new regulations, you know, all our GMSs are going to be reading these regulations and thinking about how they, how they work too. Um, you know, zero effort and then just put an estimate on there. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're, if you get pushback, which, you know, somebody eventually will, right? Right. But yeah, if you get pushback, say, you know, this was, this was an estimate based on, you know, whatever, or we can, we can have that conversation. But if you're getting pretty close to it, try to work the numbers out so that, you know, what you're representing is a close representation to their 12 calendar months, right? Because mm -hmm. the idea, the spirit of this is to be able to provide to the NIH the, um, the information that we're getting from other support, right? Yeah. So again, this is, this is getting more in line with a lot of other federal agencies and it's gonna bump, it's bumping into their other implementation, their other, um, you know, their other re regulatory requirements. Do the best you can, and to work the numbers to twelve calendar months because it's it's like that whole percentage effort, right? Yeah. You can't have over one hundred percent. So you know you start working, start equating percent effort to twelve calendar months. Try to work it into the twelve calendar months the way you can, um, and say and clearly annotate. This is you know zero calendar months. Here's our here's our um, you know 
estimate of this, you know, and uh, just feel free to put in an estimate, like a little comment in there saying this is an estimate, you know, um, and and just state it as such. And that way, if we get pushback, even in a JIT, we can talk to the GMS and find out how they want us to represent it. Because sometimes it's one of those situations where, you know, it's like, oh, they're pushing back. Well, how do you want us to display this information? We're trying to meet your requirements. Okay, sounds good. But that's not too vague. <laughs> but <laughs> the answer without answering it. But I mean, I mean, just I mean, it. It. I think. I think this. You know, this. The next what? The next twelve, four months or so with this new process is going to be. Uh, it's going to be interesting as NIH figures out what they, what they, what they care to know about and what they care about. So we'll see. Okay. <laughs> All right, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Garrett and Shane and Alex for presenting. This is always fun when NIH changes these rules and I'm sure we'll have more questions. But thank you and have a great day. Thanks.